recorded and will be available after the fact um, on the INEE website. Um, there is no, I've just seen a message in the chat, there is no interpretation today, unfortunately, but we do have closed captioning available in English. Um, so you can enable that by clicking on the uh, CC, closed captioning at the bottom of the screen. So just a few housekeeping things before we get started. So welcome to this webinar. I and E are delighted to be hosting um, the Alive team today. So um, the assessment of life skills and values in East Africa and looking at a contextualized approach. Just before we get started, um, we are using the webinar function. So your audio and video are disabled. However, during the Q&A, you should be able to raise your hand and I can enable you to speak. So we still will have a participatory element. There's also the Q&A function and we, we um, warmly encourage all of your questions throughout. We will have a Q&A um, session so you'll be able to address the panelists with your questions. So either you can put those in the chat, but ideally put them in the Q&A box so that we can find your questions easily. Um, as I mentioned, this session is being recorded so that um, we can host it on the INE website and you can revisit at any time. And it's available for those who aren't able to join us today live. We also have um, live, live closed captioning available in English. So to enable that, you should be able to see an icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, which has the CC uh, icon for closed captioning, and you can enable that. Um, and as I mentioned, recording and um, a blog as well will be available after the webinar on our website. So just to introduce our fantastic panelists today, um, we are delighted to be joined um, by the Alive team. Dr. John Mugo will be joining us. He double hats and he's upside down today, but <laughs> perhaps we can sort that out at some point. Um, Dr. John Mugo double hats as the executive director of CZ Afrique and the principal investigator of the Alive program. His current interests revolve around holistic development and expanded competency building in East Africa's children to increase success, chances in work and life. We are also joined by um, Mauro Giacomazzi, who is the Institutional Development Advisor of the Luigi Cisani Institute of Higher Education. And since 2007, he has contributed to education related research developments on assessment, among others. We are also joined by Martin Ariapa. Martin Ariapa is the Senior Monitoring and Evaluation Officer at the Luigi Cisani Institute of Higher Education. He has a background um, in statistics and demography, and his research institute interests are in psychometrics, impact evaluations, population studies, youth development, and educational assessment and evaluation. We're del delighted to be joined by Dr. Purity Ngina. Purity is the research and assessment manager at ZZ Afrique Foundation, a leading local organization in the education sector. ZZ Afrique aims at equipping children and youth with the competencies for learning, working and living. Our moderator for the panel discussion today will be Khadija Sharif. Khadija is the head of programs at Milele Zanzibar Foundation. She's interested in educational development, specifically within the area of youth leadership and training, especially on the African continent. She has a diverse experience as an educator, community organizer, and youth programs coordinator. And Khadija is the Alive Lead in Tanzania. So our agenda today is that we will hear about the Alive program, um, an introduction by John Muga. Then we are going to hear the contextualization process and findings. As I said, we'll have a discussion, a Q&A portion moderated by Khadija. And then Purity is going to lead us through the tools development process and lessons learned. And then we will close off perhaps with a few more questions if we have the time. This is a 90 minute webinar. So we hope there is plenty of time for discussion as well as presentation. Um, so now I will pass over to uh, Dr. John Mugo. Uh, John, are you sharing your own slides? Uh, yes, thank you so much. I think um, a purity will share the slides so that I don't fall the, the risk that the slides also may be upside down. <laughs> but I think uh, 
<laughs> I will figure out. I need to ensure everyone that I'm not doing a head start. Um, I am seated upright. Uh, and this calls to, I think, uh, outside the box. But allow me to welcome you and introduce you to our intervention, the assessment of life skills and life and values in East Africa. This is an initiative that uh, we started last year in August, and we are hoping uh, to, to, to go on for um, uh, another four years or so. The Regional Education Learning Initiative is, is one uh, regional initiative in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and we are also being joined by DRC. Uh, at 70 organizations working towards a common goal of learning and learning around improving learning. We, we have uh, three uh, objectives of really, uh, our vision is split into three pillars, the a knowledge hub, where we are able to consolidate um, learnings uh, around how to improve learning outcomes, uh, policy influence, how we could um, go for collaborative impact in informing uh, policy to improve learning across our countries, and transformed members, how to, uh, to build stronger um, local organizations in East Africa for the purpose of impact. And really has um, three uh, um, learning thematic areas mainly, uh, one around uh, teachers and teaching, the other area of learning is, is around um, equity and inclusion, and the last one uh, is, is, uh, is around uh, values and life skills. So this initiative is within that learning um, cluster of values and life skills. And when we started working together around 2017, in 2018, we developed three questions. We realized that in the context of East Africa, we need to first understand the competences in our context. We know there are global uh, constructs uh, on 21st century learning, transversal skills, you know, transferable soft skills. Uh, we needed to understand this and also which of these capabilities uh, would be prioritized in our context and why. Then the, uh, the other question were methods of nurturing and developing these competences in our context. And that question is, is, is around contextualized assessment. Uh, how would one best assess these competences in the context of East Africa? And so our life is uh, situated within this question three of uh, our learning. And uh, this is the journey that we began. So moving on, uh, when we conceptualized Alive, we thought uh, that the whole idea is around children. It's around learners uh, getting equipped with values and life skills. And when we looked at, we looked at our learners and the education systems here, we, we selected three pathways uh, to reaching here. First, we realized that uh, the existing tools in East Africa uh, were developed mainly for other contexts and so they were not properly contextualized. So we wanted to develop contextualized tools and generate evidence uh, uh, on, on life skills and values and targeting adolescents 13 to 17 years. We, we started with 13 to 17 years because it's what we found logical that um, move up a little bit to an age where um, uh, children ought to have learned something or accumulated a level that could be measured. Because if we measure them too early in the, in the pipeline, then, then uh, that would be mainly for a formative purpose rather than a summative. Then engaging, uh, using that evidence to engage uh, uh, public for raising awareness among teachers and their parents, but also policy to inform uh, especially system focus on these competences uh, in our curricula, in our um, uh, system assessments, but, but also in, the, in, in what teachers do to nurture them. And that is around local capacities that we realized uh, we, we hardly had anyone with expertise in measuring these um, competences in our context. So we selected the process and the path that um, um, uh, empowers us, but also em uh, emancipates us so that we are able to uh, rapidly accumulate the needed skills. We have been on a journey that, that began in 2018, as I said, 
uh, that the, our first meeting was in uh, in in Dar es Salaam. Uh, I remember it was on the 28th and 29th of June in 2018, and we have come a long way. We we inaugurated the project in August of 2020. We launched it in uh, February of of this year. We started the tool development process in April, and we have now uh, we have about 35 weeks behind us of the tool development process and learning, and we have learned a lot. So we selected um, after a very participatory process, we agreed to assess three life skills and one, one value. So the life skills are problem solving, collaboration, self-awareness, and one value, which is respect. Now, um, these are mainly, we, we arrived at this after looking at uh, what our countries have defined as the life skills of focus and what even has been uh, defined in curricula. It, it, is, it was quite similar across the three countries, but of course with, with some differences. So there were things we had to negotiate. For instance, in Kenya, the, the curriculum prioritizes self-efficacy and not self-awareness. But, but then self-awareness is, is what is prioritized in Tanzania. So, so there, there, there are a few intricate um, differences, but because we wanted to do one thing across our countries, we negotiated to have this. We think uh, that we also have interest in literacy, numeracy, and, and digital lit, uh, literacy. Uh, things, skills that we feel are important for our children, even when uh, the, our core focus is, is life skills and values. Uh, I could just highlight a few things that makes our uh, assessment unique. One is the collaboration that we are more than uh, 20 um, different organizations in three countries pursuing one goal. So we are learning a lot how to work with each other to collaborate for uh, collective impact, but also linking to the uh, to the global expertise that exists. So uh, our process is heavy uh, because it is involving many people, but we are hopeful that, that it is this heaviness and uh, including many people that will yield the capacities that we are looking for in the next three to four years. Uh, it, it's a summative household assessment. We selected the household as a beginning because this conversation is quite new and we know things like values are developed more at, at home before even children join school. So how we tried to figure out how would uh, get parents, for instance, into this conversation, if it was a school-based assessment, then they would say that that is the you know the thing of school. Then the other is to to get all adolescents in the spirit of SDGs of leaving no one behind. It is at home where we can get those that go to school and those that don't, those that go to vocational training centers or primary school or um, secondary school. And and so we are hopeful that we'll be able to give a holistic picture at the beginning of all our adolescents. We are aspiring for a simple scalable one-on-one -on -one assessment. This is a big ambition, especially the beginning on, on simple. And of course, scalable has to have some level of simple, otherwise it will be too costly. So uh, this, we, we, we don't know how much we could promise, but I think we are pretty ambitious uh, because of coming from the background of the citizen-led assessments like Uezo and ASA, we, 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 we think uh, that we could invent something that, that could draw to scale. Embedded learning is, uh, I, I have um, said this, that the tool development, it's not just about having a tool, but it's also about using that tool development process as an academy for us as, uh, as a local um, experts and growing with that. And, and so we have deep, deep learning em embedded into this. And then communications and advocacy, that it will not just be about uh, having the evidence and being happy, but communicating and um, uh, using that evidence to inform change. Then, so uh, our advocacy, uh, as, as I said, uh, we, we, we will be working a lot with the media uh, to raise awareness like local radio stations, uh, social media, and, and reaching especially those parents that, that we think are not reached. Uh, policy advocacy, our approach, is, is participatory. So we have started that even the tool development itself has an advocacy um, aspect where the institutions that will target to take the evidence to are part of the tool development and the learning process. And voice, we think that we are very uh, underrepresented on the global stage 
And this process could be one of uh, empowerment through which we could ourselves contribute also to the global uh, conversation around these competences. Our learning uh, has uh, three kind of basic postures. One is uh, learning through doing. So we have the tool development process is involving around 47 people uh, over a period of about a year. Uh, so, 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 so that in itself, you know, we are learning a lot through doing. Uh, learning with others, uh, we, we, we have this learning community, like what we are doing today. Uh, this is our land shop number eight, where uh, uh, we, we, we have kind of collected friends who have interest in, in this kind of conversations. And we are this gathering of friends, as I say, if you want to uh, go, for, go near, you, 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 you walk fast. And if you want to move further, then you walk with others. And the third uh, is learning from others. We think we have a lot to learn and we have identified various institutions that we learn from, uh, fixing learning meetings with them and, and just getting to hear from them how they have approached this. So uh, the things I think I'll, I'll hand over now to Mauro uh, to uh, continue from uh, there. And, and kindly feel free to put your questions on the chat uh, we will be back with responses to that, Mauro. Thanks so much, John, and uh, good afternoon uh, uh, or good morning, everyone. I am Marjo Gomazzi. I work at the Luigi Sunny Institute of Higher Education. And um, today, in this uh, section, uh, we shall present uh, one of the um, elements uh, that constituted our starting of the project, uh, meaning that we wanted to understand better how uh, these uh, skills that uh, uh, we have identified as being important uh, in our context, uh, how they were somehow conceptualized. Um, we wanted to really understand how these uh, skills relate to our specific uh, local context of the East African community. We didn't want to take for granted that uh, problem solving uh, or collaboration were supposed to be um, conceived uh, as universal constructs uh, that uh, have no relation to the context. So the first step that we took uh, was really to go farther into this understanding uh, to just uh, try to detect if there were any peculiarities, uh, any uh, characteristics that were so specific of this concept that was uh, to be considered um, as uh, unique. And so that could maybe influence the way we would then develop our tools. One of the first steps of developing an assessment tool is the, the step of uh, somehow developing a kind of uh, skill uh, structure or skill framework. So this contextualization study is going to feed into the next step. But uh, the aim of today's presentation is mostly to highlight those elements that can be considered to be unique. We'll go to the next slide, sorry. Yeah, I'm just trying to. <laughs> Uh, put it in presentation mode. Hold on. You are in presentation mode, well, at least yeah. on my computer. It okay, like good. It. It's just not allowing me to to move the slide, but just one one minute. Okay, is it moving now? Yes, very very well. Okay. So just um, a methodology of the study for each um, for each uh, skill that uh, we have identified and for the value uh, respect, uh, we have uh, carried out an ethnographic uh, study um, to try to with a, with a semi structural interviews um, in order to understand better what was the perception of the people about uh, these uh, skills. And so we would ask them questions like, uh, for example, uh, what uh, um, does it mean for you problem solving? How would you translate the problem solving maybe to your grandmother? Uh, which characteristics a, a 
person that you consider an adolescent that you consider to be a problem solver has in your community. In this way, we collected the views of an average of um, between 68 to 95 participants in each country, uh, representing these participants, five uh, regions in each country. Characteristic regions, it means that, for example, we interviewed uh, youth and parents and uh, educators from pastoralist communities or from people that are living in rural area or urban area. And as I was mentioning, the category of uh, uh, people that have been interviewed were adolescents, key persons, and for key persons, uh, we meant people that are dealing with adolescents. So whether they are local leaders that maybe are uh, leading the groups or teachers, um, or uh, uh, even uh, religious leaders, and then the parents. Uh, we carried out in, in first ethnographic interviews to these 95 people, and then in each village that we were having even a focus group discussion to try to verify some of the concepts that were uh, that emerged from, uh, from the interviews. We can go to the next slide. Um, after this, uh, we did uh, both uh, descriptive and uh, thematic uh, um, analysis uh, for. The thematic analysis, uh, uh, we identified a number of categories, um, the definition or the process of the, of the skill, then the sub-skills, the dispositions and values that are linked to these skills, but also we identified an, a, a number of behaviors that showcase, uh, according to the, the participants, uh, the, the skill at play in adolescence. And sometimes there were some related skills that the participants would mention. And then we also asked them to identify what are the support systems or at least in what environment can a youth grow these kind of skills. And if they had any questions or any clues about possible ways of methods for assessing these skills. Uh, next slide. In the coming... Uh, slide uh, I will just present, uh, um, we will present now briefly, myself and my colleague uh, Edmund will present uh, briefly the skill structure of each skill, uh, not so much to give an exhaustive explanation of uh, the skill in itself, but mostly with the aim of highlighting what we can consider to be the feature, the elements that are so characteristic of the East African culture. Uh, as uh, an overarching consideration, we can say that um, uh, though there are some peculiar aspects uh, in the different communities, uh, there are some differences between Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. In general, the backbone, let's say, of the skill is very, very similar. Um, and the uniqueness that I'm going to explain and present are quite cross-cut. Across the country. We can go to the next slide. We start with problem solving. So when we asked about problem solving, what it means problem solving, the elements that emerged was the fact that uh, pro the process of problem solving, problem solving requires identification of the problem, facing the problem, meaning uh, uh, being willing to look at the problem, stand in front of the problem. Elements where you try to understand and know better the problem. These uh, very, very unique element that is not found in any international literature that is asking for advice and then choosing or evaluating what is the possible best solution and, and, and the consequences of the various solution and then finding the best solution. Um, one element that is so striking is this issue of asking for advice. This is something that in my Caucasian European culture, it would uh, seem to be at first impact like something that is against the actual problem solving capacity. Meaning that I would say, if uh, you are a good problem solver, you solve the problem and you don't have to ask for advice. But um, we have in East Africa, a strong communitarian approach to life, which means that I conceive myself as part of the community and not, and not as an individual that is working in itself. So as being part of the community, 
It, it entails the fact that it is obvious that if I have a challenge, this challenge is not only my own challenge, but it is a challenge that inevitably involves and pertains and affects the whole community. So when I'm in front of a problem, if I'm a good person, I need to ask also for advice. Then I was thinking about my personal life, I'm Italian, and you know that Italians are very much close to their family. And uh, I would never have taken as an adolescent an important decision in my life without asking the advice of my parents, which is pretty much similar to this, even if uh, the literature usually hardly reports about uh, this element. We can go to the next. If we look at uh, the sub-skills uh, um, um, dimensions, we see this uh, predominance uh, of social skills as being linked to problem solving. Uh, so you need, you see elements like uh, cooperation, elements like empathy, guidance and counseling, which seems to be absurd, but actually it's part of being a good problem solver, like the quotation next to the, um, to, next to the diagram reads. It says, you can also find that they are great partners in their community. There is a problem or something that needs to, to be done in the community. They work together to try to solve the challenges they face. Second, if there is a problem in the community, they are at the forefront. But you also find that some young people solving that problem. So the issue that you are a good problem solver, it becomes an, 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 rich, an element of richness for the whole community. So you are expected to become a help to other people that have got similar problems. And so you need, you're supposed to have good counseling skills, good guidance, guidance skills, good relationship skills. And instead, the skills that are linked to the, to the self, though the most prominent was self-confidence. In general, the intrapersonal skills were a little bit at the side. So I stop here with problem solving. I will just give the floor to my colleague, Edward. Thank you, Mauro. So when it came to collaboration, we could go to the next slide. Uh, to the participants mostly, collaboration is regarded as an act of working together. But most uh, importantly, according to them, it's not uh, necessarily towards a particular goal or in doing a particular kind of work. To them, collaboration mostly meant being in a relationship with others or staying with others in a peaceful way or in a good way in the society. Uh, in some uh, few instances, it was uh, defined as uh, teamwork, or in some cases, co uh, cooperation. And in reference to the aspect of working together, mostly some refer to it as a way of helping the community, helping the community in solving problems, helping the community in doing uh, communal work and uh, the likes. And this also took into things like uh, the sharing of our general way of staying with our colleagues. Uh, in some cases, although rare, it would be regarded as having the ability to agree on certain aspects or having the unity. But the unity still goes back to the aspect of staying in a good environment or in a good relationship with all the rest around the different communities people stay in. Uh, we could go to the next, when it came to the sub-skills, uh, the sub-skills in this aspect, they mentioned still mostly the social skills. And uh, just as from the definition where they regard collaboration as working with others in terms of maintaining a good relationship, they stressed that having good relationship skills which is an umbrella of the communication skills uh, in terms of being expressive, being receptive of others, accepting others' advice, were regarded as key 
skills when one wants to improve their collaboration with others. Still, the aspect of guidance and counseling came up and to them, uh, one who is collaborative should be able to first uh, guide or counsel the colleagues in case they're in a particular group, but at the same time should be one who is receptive if others are in a way advising that particular member. And uh, still they mentioned teamwork and cooperation as a skill which could help one to improve their collaboration. Uh, we could go to the next, which is uh, respect. Uh, respect in their understanding, which also was expressed that it varies from uh, community to community. They express that respect is valuing others or honoring others. And in some cases, they would include the self, where one respects him or her self. But uh, still, they were specific in saying that how respect is interpreted depends on the context. Uh, our cultural context dictate how respect is regarded in the various communities. And in relation to that, we find that in some ways or in some situations, respect is expressed or defined in regards to the behaviors or the conduct which are expected within a particular society. And in, in that way, you can see on the left there, we have the positive conduct or the positive behaviors and things like obedience, being able to listen to instructions from the elders, uh, being disciplined and being exemplary. In general, doing things which are not contrary to what is expected of an adolescent in a particular society. And also in this uh, definition, what emerged is that uh, to some respect is having the fear of God or being God-fearing which is expressed or demonstrated through uh, praying, uh, going to church and doing uh, church-related activities and such. And then also in relation to oneself, they define it also as understanding self and taking care of oneself. As we can see on the left there, there is a a sample of a definition from one of the key persons who said, respect is showing honor to someone and taking him or her as useful to you, who is helpful and important to you or to the community or someone, even if he or she is a young child. But what we have to note also is that uh, in their explanations, they stressed that uh, Respect in most cases is demanded of those in lower positions of authority to show it to those in higher positions of authority. Specific young ones are in most cases expected to respect the elders. We could go to the next uh, slide where we have um, the sub skills which are associated with uh, respect. And uh, here, in relation to the definition or how they understood respect, where we are saying it is valuing self and valuing others, they must relate to the relationship skills, expressive communication and the receptive communication, but majorly the expressive, how one portrays him or herself in front of others is so crucial to demonstrate whether one is respectful or not. The way one speaks, the way one takes uh, commands from the elders, how one looks at the other, the dressing code, uh, how one walks and the likes were considered to be things that we could look at when you are looking at uh, a person who is respectful or not. Uh, guidance and counseling also came up here 
and specifically here is in relation to an adult talking to a young one. The young ones must be in that receptive nature where they listen to whatever comes up from their elders. And then uh, the other, which were regularly mentioned, sorry, rarely mentioned, self-confidence, empathy or feeling for the other, regulation and plan, this came up that in very few cases. Uh, then the next, which is uh, self-awareness. According to the various participants across the countries, uh, we could go to the next slide. Self-awareness was um, understood as knowing or understanding self. And uh, in this, we refer to knowing one's abilities, knowing one's weakness, knowing one's emotion, what makes one feel happy, what makes one sad, all those aspects related to the self were mentioned whenever they were talking of the meaning of self-awareness. Uh, still, taking care of self also emerged as another way self-awareness is understood. And in taking care of self, they refer to specifically the hygiene of an individual as well as their health where one ensures that they take care of their self by bathing, ensuring that they are clean all the time, and at the same time, taking all the necessary steps to ensure that they are not sick or they get the treatment whenever it is necessary. Um, if we go to the sub skills that were associated with self awareness, still we find that mostly they are related to the social skills, just like in the previous skills we have looked at and the value of respect. Uh, relationship skills is key to them. And actually, when you read uh, one of the quotes on the side, it says, a person who has self-awareness skills communicates clearly to others and also relates to others very well. So for one to be self-aware or for one to demonstrate the skill of self-awareness, they should be able to relate with others in a way which is acceptable in an harmonious way. And at the same time, they should be able to express themselves clearly so that they are understood by all the other colleagues. But at the same time, they should be receptive. And here it meant listening to others in case they are advising them, uh, listening to others in case they have different opinions from what they are putting across. And also when it relates to the self, the skill of self-confidence was mentioned to be key for one to improve their self-awareness skill. And if we can see in the quote besides there, still it says, self-confidence is so necessary for the child to have self-awareness, to help them to improve in their studies because they'll have self-trust in doing things. So, those were the key findings in regards to how the skills and the disposition of respect are understood in the various communities in the three countries. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Mauro and Edmund, for that presentation. Um, we now have some time for, for questions, and a few have come up in the Q&A, if you can see them, Khadija.
Khadija, are you able to hear me? Hi, Rachel. Uh, if I would come in, I have seen a question probably Mauro could respond is whether there were some surprises in the findings. And uh, I know Mauro mentioned one of the surprises on the problem solving. I don't know whether Mauro, you want to come in. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Michael, uh, for the question. Um, I think that uh, I've already mentioned what struck us the most. I believe that um, uh, the, this issue of the sense of belonging and this issue of the community um, conceptualization of the self, uh, which is something that also is found in the literature, um, was uh, something that um, somehow it was not, uh, how can I say, it was not a surprise in itself, meaning that we didn't find that anything that was not known in the ethnographic studies about East Africa, but connecting the dots, connecting the dots between what are the findings of the ethnographic studies and the application of these findings somehow to the, the process of contextualizing a tool. Uh, it's, it, it, this issue of contextualization is a really long process and it can be extremely expensive. So I totally understand that there is a sparse would be to say all these skills are, are cross-cutting and there is no much difference. Maybe there is not much difference, it is true, but um, there are some small elements that really change your perspective. And uh, what changed in the process is our way even of starting looking at the task development. Having understood that there are these kind of peculiarities, our inclusion process, uh, uh, that we took uh, in the path in the journey of uh, task development was uh, uh, deeply influenced by this contextualization study and how we understood that there were nuances that were peculiar. Um, then there's another question, if I'm not wrong, if I since I have my, my microphone open from James, uh, he was asking uh, which kind of differences you see. Uh, the differences are not much, but for example, in problem solving, there is a Kenya that is much more prone towards uh, highlighting aspects like leadership that in the other countries, uh, these aspects are not uh, so widely expressed, while in the other countries, especially in Uganda, there is a, a huge focus on the guidance and counseling. Um, or for example, in Tanzania, you find, uh, and maybe this one is a, a it's very much linked even to the linguistic um, approach. Uh, most of the interviews in Tanzania were carried out in, uh, in uh, Kiswahili, instead in Uganda, um, almost all of them, they were carried out in English. Um, so for example, uh, when we speak about problem solving, uh, one of the common translations of problem solving or one of the common understanding of problem solving in Tanzania is to get rid of the problem, to ex uh, eliminate the problem, uh, which in itself uh, has uh, a negative, uh, a strongly negative con connotation already. Something like a problem is something that you need to get rid of. It cannot be, or it's not usually conceived as an opportunity, maybe even to learn to discover something new or to face the reality in a more uh, satisfying way. Um, and, uh, and similarly, in, for example, in respect, uh, there are very many cultural connotations linked um, to the behaviors that uh, the society is expecting uh, from, uh, uh, the, uh, from the women, from girls, uh, compared to, to male, there is a strong, Focus, for example, in uh, the aspect of, of uh, humility in Uganda that you don't find in the other two countries. Um, and then uh, another aspect, for example, that uh, was um, still uh, unique is the fact that uh, female and male give uh, some different nuances. While uh, uh, there are some aspects of uh, respect that are uh, 
more underscore, sorry, I'll probably solve the problem, more underscoring the effectiveness of solving the problem for the female, it's much more interesting for them to, uh, or it's much more frequent for them to mention aspects like sharing, well, helping the others, being sure that the other people are, um, uh, are helping their moment of challenge. If this kind of respond, I don't know, James, if uh, this makes sense. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mario. I'm so sorry I was uh, thrown off um, as I was supposed to jump into the question and answer section. Um, but I think you addressed uh, that question really, really well. Um, uh, and, and there's another question from Ellen. Um, that's asking us following on your findings, findings, are there any plans to influence or look at how these kinds of skills and values are assessed for younger learners? Um, so maybe I can ask John to jump in to ask, uh, answer that question. Um. Sorry, sorry, Hadija, I, I, I have lost you a bit. Um, would, do you mind pointing to the question yeah. again? I had the internet issues. No, it's not a problem. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay. It was a question of basically how can we, um, are there any plans to influence or look at how these kinds of skills and values are assessed to younger learners? Yes, uh, in, indeed. So we started at the, the, the older ones because this being a summative um, assessment so that we may see the, the levels of accumulation. But we know that truly uh, these um, things like values and, and, and even largely uh, competences, uh, life, life, life skills are developed much earlier in life. So we have started the conversation of a moving uh, after the 2022 assessment, we'll also be figuring out how to move upstream and uh, engage more even at the school level, uh, focusing on primary aged children of uh, six to 12 years so that we are able to have a, a, a more complete story. So uh, we'll be heading to that uh, hopefully uh, from uh, end of next year onwards into 2023. Thank you so much, John. Um, I think I'll try and take maybe one or two more questions. Uh, we have a very good question from, um, uh, from, sorry, I am trying to find the name, uh, from Michael uh, Gibbons, uh, who was asking um, uh, about the disconnect between the social skills and the harsh individualism and content knowledge that's the focus of our uh, national exams. So how can we, uh, how is our advocacy approach um, uh, helping to, 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 to address this disconnect um, in our reform messages. Uh, again, maybe I can uh, have John answer the question. I think it's a very, very important question in terms of the, 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 the overall sort of message that uh, Alive is trying to send about what kind of assessments um, should be uh, conducted for our youth. So perhaps, uh, John, you can address that a little bit. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Michael, and uh, so so great to see you uh, here in this meeting. Um, we are lucky uh, and fortunate for one reason, that um, our three education systems in the three countries have acknowledged the worth and value of these competences and have at varied measures defined them and included them in the curricula. In, in Uganda, for instance, the the forecast they, they started from a lower secondary in in Kenya it, it began from the, the preschool and, and moving to primary and Tanzania have, have, um, varied interventions have happened. What remains now is the fact that uh, parents and teachers largely still do not understand how you know uh, one should abandon uh, the teaching of academic only kind of um, uh, subjects 
to concentrate on life skills, which are not examinable. So our way of communicating has to reach out to parents, um, letting them know that, that these competencies, that it's not an either or, it's not saying that they are, these are more important than academic and the other way around, that it is about building a holistic person. It's about a whole child development. So when these things combine, then uh, the, the chances of one succeeding in life are increased because then, then your whole self is developed. So we hope the evidence will generate from these assessments that that moment of being at the household and maybe having a parent sitting there watching uh, you, you assessing, maybe neighbors coming to see and ask what, what we are doing will be moments of communicating on why a problem solving is important, how it is important that every child and uh, adolescent is uh, supported to understand themselves, that the, the future and the present is about working together and that's collaboration and that all these things really, uh, even parents uh, should focus on them and contribute to nurturing them. Fantastic, thank you so much, John. I think uh, that's, very um, important what you highlight. And uh, maybe to answer Basilio's question about whether or not um, this uh, is a similar initiative to Uezo East Africa for what, to it, what Uezo is doing. Um, I'll say that first and foremost, uh, the Alive team is composed of a number of members who are either part of Uezo, Uezo Uganda is involved, um, Uezo Tanzania is also involved. Um, and so we're building off of uh, the Uezo approach, um, which is the household uh, assessment. Um, and so there are a lot of similarities to the Uezo uh, approach, but uh, it is focusing instead of literacy and numeracy, we're focusing on life skills and social emotional skills. And so that is where we diverge and are slightly different. But in many ways, a lot of what we're doing is trying to uh, build off of and also learn from uh, what Uezo is doing. So Uezo is, is very much part of, uh, of this uh, project. Um, I think uh, we can, uh, there's a lot more questions and I think that maybe in the interest of time, uh, we can uh, move forward with uh, the presentation from um, Purity on the tool development process and then perhaps um, we can uh, address a couple of more questions before we close. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, uh, Hadija. I know the questions that were raised. I think um, there's one question on whether we can create a universal skill language. Um, I think for me, that is a question I'm going to take home and reflect more on the same. Um, and when you think about a life and being a collaborative process and also a learning, we started on the journey of tools development. and. It has been a quite a complex and a lengthy journey. We have 48 members um, who have one vision to develop contextualized tools, but there are many challenges along the way because when you think about even reflecting on that question, whether we can have a universal language, can we also have a universal tool that can assess problem solving, self-awareness, or even a regional one? And so, it, is, it has been a very interesting journey. And of course, we, uh, we appreciate that uh, when you think about assessment, there's always generic uh, method of way or process of how to come up with it, identify the competencies. And John has really explained how we came up with the three uh, skills and one uh, value, the uh, nature. And this really has been uh, a journey, even when you look at the contextualization, we went back to the literature to try and ensure that even what we create is also something that is aligned to what is done globally, but also following very much on what the adolescents define these competencies uh, to be. And um, we have, these members are from um, various organizations, from the government, from the ministry. And during the first workshop, we went through the contextualization data in details. 
um, trying to unpack them, to understand the language of adolescents, the language of their parents, the language of their teachers, asking ourselves, this is how respect is defined globally or what is known as respect. But this is what our adolescents or our, our East Africans people know about respect. And it was a very intense workshop. We were able to identify um, and to agree on certain definitions uh, of these uh, competences. Um, and after that, we moved on to now starting to think of ideas. How can we create task-based scenarios that can be used to assess? Uh, by the time it was in May around there, we had finalized some bit of ideas on how we can assess these competencies. And we subjected the tasks to a think aloud. And our think aloud was very, was an oral think aloud. And when you think about East Africa, and John mentioned that ours is a household assessment because we want to get the bigger story about anyone going to school and anyone not going to school because these core competence are nurtured at home by the communities, the church, you know. And so it, 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 is, it was a very deliberate decision to go at home. But also, of course, we have faced many challenges even with that because it means you cannot give the adolescent something to read uh, since you're not measuring numeracy and literacy with this tool, you want to assess whether they have the competencies. And so the thing allowed was um, listening to what they are saying, uh, encouraging them to speak their thoughts. And it was very complex, but also a learning moment. Uh, and we revised the tools and we have also piloted them. And many lessons that I'll share uh, at probably we are taking home from the pilot that we just finished. And when we started the process of uh, tools development. And we agreed that when you think about collaboration, even after looking at the, uh, the literature and the contextualization findings, it was clear that collaboration is about communication, working together and negotiation. And those are the sub skills that we have adopted for their life process. Um, for self-awareness, these elements of internal self-awareness and external self-awareness. But allow me to mention sometimes these names might probably be what you see in literature, but the elements of our culture is also coming um, with us and along with us, and we are carrying that forward, especially when we are, are coming up with the tasks, because they need to speak to the East Africans adolescents. Uh, when you talk about problem solving, and I, I like what Mauro has shared about um, the challenges, you know, how him he was looking at problem solving from, he, from his culture, his community. And when he went to the field, what adolescents in Uganda uh, feel and define uh, problem solving. But yes, we decided that the sub skill for problem solving, uh, you define the problem, you find solution and you apply that solution. And for respect, and I think I wanted to talk a bit about respect because respect is the only value that we are considering. And literature really has not given us a lot to read about values. Um, maybe this would be a very groundbreaking project where we really are able to define respect and even other people working on other values can borrow from that. When we started on respect, there's always a challenge when you're defining respect because of the, our culture and also trying not to bring our culture, uh, ensuring that our culture suffocates uh, the value and, uh, and how we are trying to define it. And you can see the journey we have worked trying to contextualize, bringing 48 members who are coming from different uh, contexts, different professions. We even have musicians so that we bring the voice of everybody and we give, we, we see the bigger story because it is one thing to say you have contextualized and East Africa is also quite large. So we wanted to bring all the members who can give us different ideas. And it has taken us many times changing and changing. And I think those who are working on uh, social emotional um, skills and they are developing metrics. I think the challenge of contextualization is that you have to be very patient because every day there's a new voice and that voice must be uh, present, uh, uh, taken into consideration. And even with this long process of 34 weeks with one vision of us coming up with a contextualized um, assessment uh, tool, we have uh, piloted these tools. And when we went to the field, one of the most interesting is how sometimes you feel 
you have addressed all the challenges. But when you get to the adolescents, the way they see things are totally different. I'll probably first point about problem solving. And you can see one of the questions is that uh, leaders in our country are concerned about charcoal burning in the various communities. And when we were designing and uh, developing this uh, task, our, we were thinking about climate change, pollution, and all that. But we, when we went to the field, adolescents, some, not all, could not identify with this task. They felt this is what our parents do every day. So why are leaders concerned about it? It's not a problem. We use charcoal to, to cook. And, and you can see for us, we were thinking ahead that adolescents in East Africa probably have read, they know the effects of uh, um, uh, charcoal burning and all that, but they couldn't identify with this. I mean, we are still asking ourselves, is it because of lack of exposure or is it because this task is not working for our context? Because it's a very nice um, problem solving task. Uh, this, this boy, um, this question was on respect. Is this boy who is sick? And another friend uh, visits him and uh, he decided to take very many photographs. Um, just looking at that, this, this element that this person who is sick has not gone to hospital. Um, for me, we don't know the reason because the task is, has not uh, explained why he has not gone to hospital. But one of the assumptions is because they probably don't have resources. And so if someone takes them a photo, they might not even worry because maybe you'll take a photo, put it on social media or show it to other people who will come and help to take this person to hospital. So you can see as much as for us, we are looking at this is his privacy and we need to respect his privacy. For him, probably he's looking at, I need help. And this is what adolescents were able to analyze that, you know, we need to help this person. So there's no problem taking photo. And that element of not respecting people's privacy did not come out when we wanted to assess whether adolescents in East Africa have uh, respect. Um, and you can see this an element of getting annoyed and adding the friendship. Again, the, he might not add the friendship. He might appreciate that this friend, uh, first he came to see the person and also he's able to show the photo to other people who are likely to also come um, see this person, visit and help. And when we were discussing this, even with um, the person who has been working with us, the journey, Professor Esther Kia. One of the things she mentioned is that in her culture, it is unlikely that person will visit when you're sick without announcing. But in our culture, if you announce or if you call me because I'm a Noel and you call me and you ask whether you should visit me, I, I, I might not appreciate that question because I expect you to just come because you know I'm not feeling well. And these are some of the lessons we are learning that in the process of contextualization, even when you think about a region like East Africa, three countries put together, there's also some bit where you, we have to also think outside um, our communities and think of outside our profession and what we listen in in the global society, and also think about the adolescents who are actually supposed to interact with this tool and ask ourselves, is this question um, subjecting these adolescents to, uh, to, to places where they have even to question what their parents do or what they, uh, they know to be the norm uh, in, in, in our context, but also thinking ahead that we are not training adolescents who need to remain in the local communities, but who also need to fit in in the whole uh, society that if someone is into Rukana, uh, where probably some of the tasks might not work, but they might not stay in that county, which is in the, the, the northeastern part, um, but they might also come to the city where some of these things have changed and, and, you know, so trying to balance all those and asking ourselves where we want to see our adolescents in the next five years, I think uh, is guiding us, but also making our process quite complex, but also very interesting. Uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah. I take it back to Rachel Hadija. Okay, uh, I think it's back to me. Um, thank you so much, Purity, for uh, highlighting that uh, 
very um, exciting uh, tool development process that we've been going through um, as one of the members of those 48 individuals who uh, have been developing this, I attest to the fact that it has been uh, quite a, an interesting journey. And as uh, you have highlighted in just the way that respect has been able to be, uh, to, to change and transform in terms of its definition um, over just a few months of, of, of our engagement with that skill, um, I can say the same thing for uh, self-awareness, as well as for um, uh, collaboration and problem solving, I'm sure. And I think one of the things that, that, we're, that, that at least I just realized is the degree to which contextualization has been happening along the way. We, we, we started off with the con contextualization study that uh, gave us sort of a very uh, sort of formal understanding through a, 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 a well-designed study um, on how uh, these skills are defined um, in context. But then as we engage with various different uh, partners with uh, the government, as well as teachers, as well as practitioners, we are continuing to contextualize. As we design the skill structure, we're continuing to, to contextualize. As we design the, the tasks, we continue to um, go get more and more uh, uh, understanding of, 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 of these skills in context. And I think we're, we, we can probably go on and on and on, as you say, um, everyone's input um, might change a little bit the, 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 the overall sort of um, definition. And so that's, I think, one of the very unique elements of, uh, of, this, um, of this project. Um, and so maybe I believe we have a couple more questions and since we have a little bit more time, there are some questions that I've been directed to um, in a Google document here. Um, so um, perhaps, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe I can um, try and, 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 and address the question by Makini Getuno, uh, who asks, what is fundamentally different in East Africa's education system as, as far as life skills and assessment is concerned? Is there a philosophy um, guiding uh, that um, the life skills. Um, I, I think that's a it's a it's a it's an interesting question, and perhaps um, I can get support from uh, from Mauro uh, maybe to, to to address this. But I think from from our point of view, maybe I can just start by saying that um, at this point uh, we we can understand more about life skills in each individual country in terms of the curriculum and in terms of um, um, the philosophy guiding. Uh, life skills within each country, but at the at the East Africa level, um, I I don't know if there's something that can be um, common across uh, uh, the three countries so far. But in terms of the work that we're doing, um, uh, what we've been able to come up with, or what we're working on, is a regional framework. And so I think that's uh, in terms of developing uh, skill structures for these particular skills. So we can speak to that a little bit more. Um, but I don't know if we can speak to necessarily a philosophy. Um, guiding uh, uh, the East African um, life skills, understanding of life skills so far. But uh, can Mauro or maybe John add to that a little bit? Um, I don't know if you want, I can say something. I believe that uh, there is a common philosophy also because of the East African community and also the Ministry of Education in East Africa, I believe that they are coordinating towards the same direction. And there has been a shift uh, from even a, a curriculum uh, that is uh, basically objective-based to a curriculum that is more um, research-based, competency-based. What does this mean? It's uh, really a shift in mentality that uh, we, we are trying to achieve. Um, and I strongly believe that uh, changing the curriculum is a very good step in the right direction. The philosophy changes uh, or requires this new philosophy uh, or approach to, to the education or the, the conceptualization of uh, the curriculum requires a mentality shift, a mentality shift that uh, has to start with the policymakers and they are demonstrating, especially the curriculum development centers are demonstrating to go in the right direction. But concurrently, uh, there is need to have the buy-in of the school leaders and uh, the teachers and the parents themselves. Um, especially with the teachers, we work a lot with them. And they have been exposed the whole of their life to a way of uh, 
teaching and learning that is uh, teacher-based, teacher-centered, and that is uh, based on uh, cramming factual knowledge. To start becoming researchers themselves and ask the students uh, to become uh, co-participants of the production of the context and development of the content or the content of the lesson is uh, something that uh, they needed to be helped with. It's not something that they can imagine. It is really something that uh, needs a lot of uh, follow-up, accompaniment, and uh, uh, coaching, tutoring. For this reason, we cannot take for granted the fact that having a good, uh, good rules and regulations will automatically uh, lead to a shift. The change of the national uh, examination systems and the inclusion in the national examination systems of elements of formative assessment, like the new curriculum in Uganda is uh, suggesting, and so a competence-based evaluation is the also helping a lot because we all know that in East Africa, the end of cycle examination still have a huge backwash effect. So in this system, it is paramount that um, all the different actors are helped to this mentality shift that uh, thanks to God, somehow it is common to the whole of the East African community. Hope that I somehow answer. I understand that uh, your question was quite complex, so I might have been super brief. No, I, I think that was very well articulated. Thank you so much, Mauro. Um, I believe uh, we may, I'm not sure if we have any more questions. Um, I think one, one question has been answered about the number of different problem solving scenarios. Uh, that were developed. So perhaps I can just maybe take this opportunity um, to thank everyone for, uh, for attending and for participating and for engaging with us. Um, uh, we uh, really appreciate the interagency for um, uh, uh, education in, in emergencies um, uh, for uh, hosting us and for uh, providing this platform. Um, and for allowing us to connect with uh, people from so many different parts of uh, the globe. Um, we invite you all to uh, uh, engage with us through the various different platforms. We will have more learn shops uh, coming up, but we also have a website. Um, we have social media uh, platforms. We have uh, Twitter as well as, um, as uh, um, can be found on, um, on other uh, platforms, please visit the Rally uh, website, rallyafrica.org, um, rally um, and you will be able to find out more information about Alive. Um, and I would love to also thank my colleagues, um, John Mugo and Mauro, as well as Purity for uh, their presentations. I think that if I can say anything, um, I would love to say to all of those uh, listening that, um, um, if, I, if you can walk away with understanding anything about a life, I, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, you can walk away understanding that um, this is a, a, an intensive learning process, um, but it's also a, a very contextual process. Um, and uh, we are also um, continually um, inviting uh, more people to, to become part of our um, network. So you are all welcome. Um, and uh, we hope um, that you will join us, especially in the next stage when we, uh, after we have um, collected all of this information and this evidence um, to be able to advocate for the, the changes that we would like to see um, in terms of, uh, as uh, John said, uh, making sure that we have, uh, we, 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 we ensure our children become holistic um, uh, learners and not just focusing on, uh, I think, the, the issue of just high stakes exams. So thank you so much for uh, everyone and, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give it back to Rachel. Thank you so much Khadija and thank you to everybody um, for your presentations today and for, for answering those questions. Um, the, the contextualization question is a huge one and, and Purity, I just wanted to say um, it really struck me what you said about the patience that's required for this and that every day there's a, there's a new 
um, voice to listen to. And just one final question, if you'll allow me, as we have a few minutes. Um, I was wondering if you could um, speak a little bit more about how you incorporate all the voices that, that you're listening to and if, if there's ways to give weight to different voices or, or how, do you, how do you account for this new um, information that keeps coming up throughout the contextualization process? Um, thanks, Rachel, and I'll also invite John um, to come in, but uh, what we have been doing is just allowing every voice, um, because we believe that these 48 members working on the tools development are, are experts in their own way, and uh, of course it has made the process quite long. Uh, we uh, listen to the voice, we analyze it together, and we make a decision together, because again, ours is at in the process of learning and in the process of ensuring that the East African voice is felt in this tool that we are developing, then there's no one uh, who has monopoly of knowledge. So everybody is coming there to learn, to share. Uh, and, and I think, as I said, it, it, has, it has taught us so many other things, but I, let me uh, invite John because um, I think he has been with this uh, for a very long time. And also he's a principal investigator for their life projects. Yeah, John. I, I think, Peter, you have captured it, that um, it, it's an issue of paying respect to the context and, and, and being very sensitive to um, that, that it's not just about what literature says and defines, but, but also through the eye of the people who live that reality that you assess. So, so that, especially for researchers, is, is a very compromising situation where you, you feel like, as Mauro explained, for instance, that uh, they see a social aspect in problem solving. And we know from literature that, that problem solving is an extremely you know, um, cognitive uh, process. So we, we have adapted the process uh, we, for, for each of these skills. We have a team that works uh, now uh, continually on it and uh, we, with the lead, and, and uh, the, the leads are situated in different places, but the members are, are also constituted from the three countries so that they are, they are able to compare contexts. And uh, the, the other thing is um, uh, that we, we did not just do one, one of contextualization and then came now to design the tools, but as Pirate explained that uh, we embed in the process this um, uh, uh, it, it, iterative process of going back and, and testing with the adolescents and, and coming back to the drawing board. And even things that we think ourselves ought to work very well, like the examples that were given, uh, have often surprised us. And, and, uh, and, and so it, it's this, I think, complexity of uh, assessing in context that is extremely uh, uh, um, intellectually stimulating for us. And, and we think since it's a learning process, uh, we are still early. Uh, in the process, but I think uh, uh, in, in, in another one to two years, we may have a lot of experience and insight to share from what we are doing and learning. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, we'd love to continue learning with you together. And as I mentioned to you on, on sort of our organizing calls, we'd love to host you again um, along the way to, to share in your learning. And, and I'm sure a lot of the participants would agree. Um, so yes, just a huge thank you to you all for sharing your time, sharing your expertise, your knowledge, your experience. Um, it's been a very, very rich um, webinar indeed. And um, just as a final request to our participants, we have um, a Mentimeter link I'm just dropping in the chat. And the Alive team would love to get your um, feedback just on how you felt this webinar went and, and if there's anything that could be improved for next time. Um, Thank you everybody for joining us today. As I mentioned, we'll share this recording on the INEE site and um, there will be an accompanying blog as well. And um, hopefully you've all got the link there for, for the um, Twitter, for the Alive program and um, for rallyafrica.org. But we will share all of these links again with you um, and the social media as Khadija mentioned earlier um, in a follow-up email. 
So thank you everybody for your time and wishing you all a good day, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs>